So welcome to the Coronary Challenge and Case Competition. Uh, my name is Ruhari Naidu, I'm uh, the director of the cath lab and HCM center at Westchester Medical Center. I'm joined by Rick Schunk from uh, UCSF, and we have an outstanding panel to review these cases, uh, Dr. Galati, Dr. Um, Klein, Dr. Tadoran, and Dr. Koshi, filling in for Dr. Um, Dr. Khalili. So what we'll do is we'll go through cases from 8.30 all the way till 9.45. Um, we will have some uh, moderated discussion. I do want to encourage audience participation. These should be fun. And um, I guess if it's the semifinals, I guess we'll be some voting as well. So first up, we have a presentation by Giannis uh, Pisis, uh, delayed complete heart blight due to first septal perforated occlusion during PCI to the LAD. So it's... Um this case is about a 64-year-old, 67-year-old woman with diabetes who presented with a stable angina. Um, so on ECG, we can see some uh, mild ischemic changes in the anterior leads. And uh, on coronary angiography, we see a diffusely diseased LAD with a very significant lesion at the beginning of the mid-segment, just distal to the origin of a small and heavily diseased first diagonal and an important uh, first uh, septal perforator. There is also significant disease on the intermediate branch and um, diffuse atheromatosis of a relatively small circumflex. Uh, fortunately, she had a large right coronary artery with no significant disease. So uh, the plan was... Uh, to do PCI uh, to the LAD. Our strategy was to uh, put only one wire, uh, no need to wire this uh, small and uh, very diseased diagonal. Never need uh, to wire uh, septal perforators because uh, they take off with a sharp angle and almost never close. Then uh, pre-dilate, uh, put a stent uh, uh, 2.25 uh, throughout uh, the, through the bifurcation and then post-dilate with a 3-0 balloon uh, before the branches, proximal to the branches. Then give nitro and uh, see if uh, there is a need to put another stent possibly in the mid-segment. <clears throat> so we proceeded with the balloon and... Uh, Uh, we really need to see the video. Okay. Uh, this is the result after ballooning. Uh, then we put a, a 2.25 by 18 uh, stent and post dilated with a 3 balloon. Uh, after stenting, uh, uh, the patient uh, complained of uh, mild angina. We can see that. Uh, uh, the first septal branch is closed. Uh, first septal branch is closed, but there were no changes on the ECG uh, or no conduction abnormalities. Uh, we gave some nitro. The pain passed. We proceeded as planned to put another stent uh, on the mid-segment. Uh, then is, uh, is the result after the second stent. This is our final result. Uh, it is not excellent, but it's uh, acceptable. Uh, uh, we have no significant disease in proximal and middle LAD, diffuse disease of, of uh, distal LAD, uh, and uh, definite loss of the first uh, septal perforator. The patient was asymptomatic, uh, ECG was uh, stable, so she went to her room. Uh, uh, the first ECG showed the T-wave inversion in the arterial leads. Uh, but a few hours later, she complained of angina. We did immediately an ECG that showed a new right, right bundle branch block with no ST segment elevation. We did immediately an echo that showed uh, uh, normal uh, LV function, normal uh, uh, anterior wall motion, but please observe. Uh, 
this uh, small akinetic segment of the basal septum that is caused by the infarction, caused by the occlusion of the first septal. We didn't think it was an acute centrobosis. Uh, so uh, she was transferred to the CCU for monitoring. She stayed dead for two days. Uh, she was uh, asymptomatic. Uh, ECG was uh, the same with right band uh, branch block. The echo was the same, so she was uh, discharged after two days. And um, uh, after two days, on day five after PCI, she had two episodes of syncope. She was transferred Im emergently to another hospital. She had uh, <coughs> complete heart block. Uh, they put uh, a temporary pacemaker. There were no signs of ischemia. Uh, she had no pain, uh, no uh, normal uh, LV function, so they didn't uh, consider it was a subacute standard bosses. They rather uh, implanted the permanent DDD pacemaker, and uh, then she was discharged in a good condition. I saw her um, after two months. Uh, she, she had no angina, good LV function, but she was on paced rhythm. So we conclude that a complete heart block uh, can occur as a delayed complication uh, of a septal perforation occlusion during PCI in the LAD, and uh, uh, probably a new right bundle branch block uh, after PCI in the proximal LAD is a predictor of complete heart block. Uh, there are other two cases, uh, similar cases in the literature. Uh, where uh, there was a delayed uh, complete heart block after the loss of the first septal. And uh, all three cases, in all three cases, the, uh, a new right bundle uh, block preceded. Thank you. Great. <laughs> a great case. I'm going to remind all the speakers we, we have a very tight session today. A lot of uh, five minute presentations and five minutes as we'll try to catch up. We're already behind, believe it or not. This is a great case. Um, I think uh, we do at Washington Neck a lot of alcohol septal ablations. We do about 30, 35 a year now. And this is what we see when you do alcohol ablation. What's unusual here, you get the right bundle branch block, ST elevations, and uh, Q waves in the, in the uh, uh, V1, V2 anterior leads. Uh, what's unusual here is that they have done um, studies looking at occlusion of the first septal perforator and results of uh, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And it doesn't really work usually because of the vast collateralization of the septum. So I think this case is probably uh, exhibits that there's so much diffuse disease everywhere that there is no way to recruit any other uh, blood flow to the septum and you get a focal infarction. Um, so I, I don't know if I would say that you have to worry about this in every case. Uh, probably in the 99% you do not have to worry about it. But certainly if you see signs of right bundle, you have to start thinking about it like an alcohol ablation case and, and go through that literature in terms of the risks of uh, heart block after that. But that's great. Any other qu questions? Should we attempt to, you know, locate for the first step of operator when it got accrued at that time? <coughs> well, I think... Uh, we compare some chest pain, and it is a first step of operator. Yes. Sometimes, in my experience, we've seen it, we were successful in recovering. Yeah. I think traditionally, no. I think traditionally, because of the takeoff of it and the collateralization of that area, you don't get a sizable infarct in that area. So I don't think it's a routine measure to do it. I think if the patient's having ch was not having chest pain, then had chest pain, Maybe it's reasonable at that point to do that. Was well, she not in chest pain at that time? Yes, yes, she had. Uh, you, you are right, uh, because she had angina, we could try to open it. Um, she was a uh, moderate uh, attempt, you know, sometimes yes. successful. Uh, you know. Usually it's uh, a. Uh, it is not included. I know what's up in the way it comes in. It is reported. It is well, not included. The unusual thing is the uh, bundle happens right away during the actual alcohol ablation case. The right bundle batch happens right away. So I don't know if the monitor is showing the right bundle during the procedure. No, no, no. And we had an ECG so after that didn't show. Uh, yes. uh, I'd like to say that it's uh, pretty difficult uh, to rewire and occlude the first septal because right. it's. Uh, it's uh, not dangerous, yes. but you can try it Yes, yes, you, you can. I, the I, thing I, that, uh, when I saw your case, it's a beautiful result, but I think there's so much diffuse disease, I wonder if there was a role for just balloon angioplasty. Um, you know, it's one of those cases where there's so much disease, uh, even distally. Stenting is what we always do, but especially when you have so much uh, branch disease, maybe balloon angioplasty would be okay. Uh, what? Great case. How should you wait before seeing complete heart block and putting the pacemaker? Uh, we, we kept her for two days, and uh, we even uh, started a uh, small dose of beta blocker that uh, probably we, it was wrong. Then we discharged, we discharged her on day three, 
since he was uh, uh, for two days asymptomatic with no change in ECG and echo. Uh, complete heart block, uh, uh, how, how do you wait to put the permanent pacemaker? It was done in another hospital. They just uh, implanted it the, the next day. Yeah, uh, Uh, actually, I saw her uh, after six months, and she had red bl block. Right. So well, it, it's intermittent. Always stay. We'll almost always stay. Yes, yes. But the, uh, the heart block may go away, and the rapid majority. So we're gonna. It's a great case. We're gonna keep moving. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Great case. Our next case is a postpartum nightmare presented by Debraj Das. Most people say Debra, and then they see that uh, it's not Debra, so I'm glad you got not that Deborah. right. Yeah, that's like 1% <laughs> of the population there. All right, good morning everyone. So my name is Debraj Das. I'm uh, from the University of Alberta and the Mazankowski Alberta Heart Institute. I'm not sure if there's any other Canadians uh, in the audience, but uh, from up north. So I have an interesting case uh, titled A Postpartum Nightmare. So we have a 32-year-old female. She's G1P1 with no past medical history, no family history. She's only taking prenatal vitamins and she's not a smoker. She's not using any alcohol and no drug abuse history. She underwent an urgent C-section for obstructive labor. And postpartum day four presented to a community hospital with acute chest pain, shortness of breath, nausea, and diaphoresis. On physical exam, she was hypotensive, tachycardic, tachypnic. Uh, she's requiring 10 liters of oxygen to maintain her saturations. She has an elevated JVP, a positive S4, and bilateral crackles. So we did a 12 lead ECG at that time, which revealed ST elevation in the anterolateral leads with reciprocal depression. And shortly after that, a chest X-ray, which was reported to have bilateral airspace disease consistent with pulmonary edema. Some basic investigations were also performed. We find uh, that she had a troponin that was elevated, a creatinine kinase elevated. Uh, she also had a CTPE scan, uh, which showed evidence of interstitial pulmonary edema and no evidence of a PE. She had a high white count, she was anemic and thrombocytopenic. So, uh, she was taken immediately to the cath lab. And first shot of the right coronary. Oh, it should be looping, unfortunately not, there we go. Uh, nothing too remarkable there. And then when we took a shot of the left system, I bring your attention to the mid LAD here. Okay, and then we have another shot here. So uh, we, we use a carrot diagram uh, in Alberta there. It's a cartoon representation of the coronary tree. And so the interventionalist at the time documented a 90% uh, lesion in the mid-LAD with associated spontaneous coronary artery dissection. So due to her hemodynamic instability, uh, she underwent PCI. It's just the wiring of what we thought was the true lumen. And then uh, we had a, the insertion of a 2.75 by 28 Zion stent into the mid LAD. This was the result we got. And then we have one more shot uh, just with the wire out. And again, a cartoon representation of where the stent was implanted. 
So we, uh, shortly after that, we had an echo done. EF was documented to be 40 to 45% with anteroapical akinesis and no significant valvular abnormalities. But within 24 hours, her clinical status continued to deteriorate. She had recurrent chest pain, decompensated heart failure, and dynamic ECG changes. She was at a community center, so she was transferred to the Heart Institute uh, we have locally there uh, for consultation from cardiac surgery. Now, before the surgeons wanted to do anything, and due to the fact that she was getting increasingly worse, they asked for another angiogram. And this one will bring your attention to the circumflex territory, the prox LED, as well as the left main. And this is just within 24 hours. shot. And we can see here that from the diagram that there is new dissection, not only in the prox LAD, but now in the entire circumflex territory, as well as into the distal LAD. The right coronary, however, stayed uh, relatively intact. A repeat echo was done shortly after that angiogram. EF had already worsened, it was 30 to 35%. There was extensive anteroapical akinesis with only preserved basal function, and there was new mild to moderate insu uh, mitral insufficiency. She continued to have cardiogenic shock for the days afterwards, decreased LOC, worsening urine output, increasing lactate, and was ultimately taken to the operating room for the insertion of a Levitronics LVAD, and then taken back 72 hours after that for the insertion of a HeartMate 2. She was discharged after uh, four weeks in hospital and is currently on our transplant list. So I just wanted to highlight the mechanism for uh, uh, spontaneous coronary artery dissection. It's usually in four steps. Of course, you have an intimal tear or bleeding of the vasovasorium, creation of a false lumen, and then pressure-driven expansion of that false lumen, ultimately causing luminal obstruction and myocardial ischemia. This is a nice uh, pictorial representation from the uh, group out in the University of British Columbia. Shows again in uh, the diagram on the right, the development of the intramural hematoma and then ultimately in C, the luminal obstruction and the subsequent myocardial ischemia. Now with, uh, uh, sorry, I'm wrong way. With pregnancy-associated SCAD, the entity is a little bit different. There we have hormonal weakening of the arterial wall and the hemodynamic shifts of pregnancy as long, along with arterial wall stress during Valsalva and labor causing uh, the development of SCAD. Risk factors from the literature are multiparity, in vitro fertilization, and preeclampsia. And oftentimes these patients come in quite a bit sicker. They are often patients who have STEMI, multivessel, or left main SCAD and often have LV dysfunction with EFs less than 40%, and really revascularization must be considered in all unstable patients. And with that, I'll say thank you. Thank you, great case. Um, having seen 2,000 SCAD angiograms last week, is my 2,000th. 2,000. Uh, 2000 uh, and I, I will say, we have a paper coming out in a few weeks showing that the pathology is actually intramural hematoma first, interval dissection second. And what I think happened here is that you see all the exit of the hematoma by stenting. And there was a diffuse hematoma at the beginning and just accumulated upstream and spread down into the circumflex. It was a great case highlighting multiple issues. I will say though, there was Timmy 3 flow at baseline, and did you consider just backing off and maybe supporting the LB and not instrumenting the coronaries? That would have been a not yeah. crazy thing to think about. And that was, that was discussed multiple times uh, after the case was done. Uh, and the other, the other one was whether or not we needed to use any uh, imaging, uh, IVIS or OCT at the time, but the, the decision at the, by the interventionalist at that time uh, because she was unstable, when heart failure was hypotensive, was to uh, insert a stent. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push back on that, just for, for education purposes. Of course. So, so there were two things here. So when we say she was unstable, you have to think about why, because there was Timmy 3 flow. 
And I would urge you and people to recognize that pain in SCAD is often not ischemic. It's mm -hmm. coming from the vessel wall. So you, you have to go on other things. You have to go on the hemodynamics and the flow. Okay. And, I, and I think um, that's just an important lesson in SCAD. Yeah. Would you have used imaging or not? No. 100% okay. no in this yeah. case because the story was so compelling. The angiogram yeah. was compelling. There's a paper coming out by a different group in Jack Intervention sh soon showing a higher risk of, of instrumentation with OCT. So while it's beautiful images, we almost don't do any OCT these days in mm -hmm. SCAD, having done a lot in the early days. You will not do your diagnostic test? I wouldn't do an either for him because the child, you know the diagnosis. Yeah. There's no ambiguity here. Is there any experience that this kind of patient you just give them a sport with a broom pump or impella and then see how they do? Is there anything known that? Can, yeah, I actually want to ask about the balloon pump because there's a theoretical worsening, right, of it. Essentially, the balloon pump. with a balloon pump, would oh. you just put them on ECMO, maybe with an impella for? and just let it rest. What's your take on it? Yeah, so the, the community center that we had didn't have that support. Um, so she was probably in the community center for about 36 hours before it transferred. Um, and then it was within, uh, you know, it wasn't really until she was, you know, had worsening lactate, decreased LOC until the surgeons were like, yeah, we're gonna do something about it. Uh, there wasn't a discussion for balloon pump or echo right off the bat. We just, we don't have that uh, at that the facility. Uh, afterwards? Did you keep it going or did you no, no, we just continued DAPT. We did not continue anticoagulation. There again is, you know, uh, evidence to suggest that the hematoma might get worse with worsening anticoagulation. So uh, at the time, we just continued aspirin, Plavix. And then once that cycle gets started where you've got an intramural hematoma, is there any role for a cutting balloon to relieve the pressure? I think if there's, if there's anything at all, it would be balloon fenestration from an interventional standpoint. I mean, this, we could talk about this for hours. It's a wonderful case. We just looked at a whole series of conservatively managed SCAD, and actually one in six will worsen to the point of occlusion in the first week. So even conservative therapy that I was advocating for is not the ideal scenario. I think uh, uh, the, the fenestration option is a very reasonable one if there's occlusion. You don't need a cutting balloon. This is an extremely fragile intima. A little balloon at low pressures will fenestrate. And I think if you're going to do anything, that will be my, uh, my preferred choice um, uh, of PCI. Thank you very much. Can, can I just quickly ask, out of the 2,000 cases, did you have any postpartum cases? So there's, uh, in the registry now, yeah. we have 1,000 in the registry, there's 5% postpartum. It used yeah. to be the old issue would say it's 30%, but we're seeing it, I mean, I'm sure you're all seeing SCAD these days. Yeah. It's now about 5%. Comes in the first week. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Move on to uh, a second attempt at an odd or an old, I can't tell, if it's, it says odd here, CTO of the LED by Yasser Akhtar. Is it odd or is it old? It is odd. All right, thank you panel moderators for, for having me. Um. I guess I have nothing to disclose. My name is Yasser Akhtar. I'm an uh, interventionalist in uh, East Tennessee. We have some East Tennesseans in the audience as well. This is a second attempt at an odd CTO of the, of the LED. This is a 52-year-old gentleman with a history of known CAD. He's previously, about 10 years ago or, or so ago, had a circumflex stent. And about last year, was found to have an occluded uh, LED as well. So this was essentially a known CTO. Had a failed attempt at a tertiary center and, and was referred to us for a second opinion. He's been having ongoing angina with exertion, has difficulty working at his job. He's had a nuclear stress test showing extensive ischemia in the anterior wall. He works at a, at a driver, and uh, the reason I brought it that he works with the Department of Transportation is they have very strict guidelines on who can go back to work and who, who can't, especially if you're driving a truck. He had an attempt initially, it took four hours. He was told, this can't be opened, just, just quit, apply for disability, and enjoy the rest of your life. This is the, the, the first attempt that was done at the other hospital. So the, uh, there's a dual angiogram. The collaterals are fairly faint. And they're mostly, in my, in my opinion, were left to left. 
from the circumflex, but you can barely see an LED, a very tiny LED ghosting in. He was evaluated by, by, by the surgeons at the first institute as well who thought, well, this is a diffusely diseased LED. We don't think a Lima bypass is going to work, so they essentially attempted a, a CTO. Uh, this is still, again, the first attempt when we got the film. So they, they tried to poke at the ostium with an uh, anterograde approach using a Pilot 200. Told it can't be open. He still has ongoing chest pain. His LV function over the year decreased 50 to 40 percent. His stress test was repeated again. Still showed high degree of ischemia when he when he came to a, a, another cardiologist. So he was re referred to us for a second opinion. Can something be done? So upon re reviewing some of the other angiograms uh, from his past, and we saw this picture. What, what is this? Where is this coming from? It was sort of you know light bulb went off and then we, we were like, okay, well maybe this guy has hope. So this is our dual angiogram. Any thoughts on what this was at this point? Yeah, I think someone's an anomalous LED. Oh, yeah. Right, so we, we fortunately had access to his original cath that was done 10 years ago when they did the circumflex stent and they actually found an anomalous course. So we, we reviewed that film. We saw that it was taking a benign course. So we, we talked to him about an option of, of, of attempting to, to, to treat this. So we tried the real anterograde approach by going through the RCA. We, used a, we wanted to use a, a somewhat of a softer wire, not a very aggressive wire to see how it tracks because it was a space we've never, well, personally I've never been in before. Um, but unfortunately, the, the, the fighter wire went fairly smoothly. What wire is this? This is a fighter wire. The collateral circulation wasn't great, so we still weren't, weren't sure whether are we true lumen or not. But on, approximately, we could tell that we, we, were, we were confident we were true, and then we could get in multiple branches and after we've exchanged out for a workhorse mm -hmm. wire. This is after balloon angioplasty. We did have to end up using a guide liner as well. So, still diffusely diseased, not the best runoff, but we decided to go ahead and stent from the proximal portion of the LED, place two long drug eluting stents. That's a real LED. And still somewhat diffusely diseased distally. This is our final angiogram. So he had an anomalous LED arising from the RCA that was chronically occluded. Uh, critical to review the prior angiograms as, as far back as you can go before attempting a, a complicated uh, a C2O revascularization. On follow-up, his, his angina is resolved and he's back to work. All right, thank you very much. Was he here for the CTA before this? Yeah, that in hindsight would have been a good idea. We did review, after we had access to his, uh, seat, his uh, prior cath, we were, we were confident this is not taking a, an aggressive course in between the PA and the aorta. Even before but, we up for surgery, yeah. I think when they considered CT, it should have a better problem. Yeah, I think that would have been a good idea in hindsight to have, have that data with us, the CT coronary of the heart. Any other questions? It's a great case. I think it uh, teaches us to look very comprehensively and make sure, I think it's always tough to know how big that LED is, so that's where that would, would help us, I think. Yeah. But right. very nice case, thank you. Okay, our, uh, our next presentation is the dreaded old vein graft. I can't read this very by Arslan Shaukat. Did I get that right? Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to present my case. The 
So I recently completed my interventional cardiology fellowship at uh, Abbott Northwestern and Hennepin County Medical Center. And uh, the title for my presentation is The Dreaded Old Vein Graft. So my case is that of an 87-year-old female who had a, a prior history of cabbage a long time ago, about 26 years ago. She had had a lima to the LAD, a vein graft that went sequentially to the, to the diagonal and the OM1, and a vein graft that went uh, sequentially to the right PDA and the distal left circumflex. And uh, these grafts were uh, previously known to be patent. Uh, she, did, uh, she, she had had a prior PCI to the vein graft to the PDA and, and, and left circumflex back in 2012. And this time she presented to us with inferior STEMI and, and really classic inferior uh, EKG changes. So knowing that and knowing her graft uh, anatomy, uh, we went ahead uh, and uh, essentially uh, um, injected the, the vein graft going to the RPDA and the distal left circumflex with a multipurpose guide straight away. And as you can see in this angiogram pretty uh, clearly that as, as we were sort of expecting, there's a, a occlusion with a large amount of thrombus burden and really the whole uh, vein graft is uh, essentially filled with clot there. So we went ahead and uh, tr uh, tried to wire this. We initially used a uh, Samurai um, RC, sort of a soft wire there, and uh, we decided initially to uh, perform aspiration thrombectomy to uh, see if we can reduce the thrombus burden a little bit here because it was, it was an acute situation with an inferior STEMI. Uh, we had a significant difficulty getting our uh, ex seven French export uh, down into the distal portion of the graft, so we downsized a little bit, used the six French, which did go a little bit further down, and, uh, and transiently we were able to get some flow going down the graft, and as, as you can see, it is filling the, the left, distal left circumflex and going all the way uh, proximally, but you're not really seeing the RPDA, probably because of distal embolization here. So it, right uh, after this, uh, she continued to have no reflow. Uh, the graft was, was, would close, and uh, she would basically, uh, was continuing to have, have chest pain on the table, and the inferior ST elevations were still present on the monitor. So after this, uh, we then tried to wire the vein graft with, a, with the support of a microcatheter. We used a, a Fielder FC with a micro cross 14 microcatheter and uh, initially performed multiple uh, balloon inflations with a 2-0 balloon to see if that would help. But uh, the flow really remained uh, poor. Uh, so at this point, uh, we thought, okay, what, what else can we do to try and uh, reduce our thrombus burden? Uh, so. Uh, one of the, so next we went to a laser. So we used the, the Exima laser with a 0.9 millimeter. We actually used the, the turbo one uh, so that we could do sort of, sort of longer runs uh, and uh, did multiple passes and, um, and, and really were, were uh, not having much luck here at this point. So uh, at this point, uh, we thought, okay, now it's probably time for, uh, for a switch in strategy. So luckily what did happen for us though is that we were able to get our Fielder FC guide wire uh, all the way through the vein graft and as it's in its place, so it, and, and into the distal and almost up to the proximal left circumflex retrograde at this point. So, so now we thought, okay, we have made progress here. At least we're retrograde uh, up quite a ways uh, to the proximal circumflex, almost to the left main. And given her acute situation, we switched our strategy to see if we can uh, apply a retrograde PCI, a CTO PCI technique here. So we got a second access, we got an eight French EVU four guide catheter. Initially we tried uh, some stiffer wires retrograde to see if we could uh, uh, get all the way to the left main ostium and into the aortic root and then potentially snare a wire, uh, the retrograde wire. So we used a Pilot 200, a Gaia second, and then even a Hornet 14, but we really could not uh, get retrograde up to the aortic root. And uh, the other issue, the other challenge in this case was that the left main was a flush occlusion. So with our uh, left, left guide, we were having significant difficulty trying to engage the left main to, go, to try and go anti-grade and puncture into the left main. Uh, so what we did was uh, essentially uh, our retrograde uh, wire did, make, uh, did go quite a ways close to the left main ostium. And so uh, and, and we thought the length of the occlusion after this was probably short. So we used the retrograde wire as a marker to see where the left main ostium most likely is. And uh, after multiple attempts uh, uh, with a Confianza Pro 12 uh, wire, we were, we were able to advance that parallel to the retrograde uh, wire. And then we got a Corsair Pro over uh, the Confianza Pro 12, uh, switched it out for a Pilot 200, and knuckled it all the way to the mid-left circumflex, and you can see the, uh, the knuckle off that Pilot 200 wire. 
and uh, decided to do, because of all the significant disease and uh, we did not want to compromise the, the left main either, we decided to do a reverse cart uh, technique here uh, in the proximal to mid-left circumflex. Uh, initially we tried with a 2.5 balloon, but that failed. Uh, so then we decided to do a guideliner assisted reverse cart in, in which essentially you try to get the, uh, a guideliner as close as possible to the area of re-entry uh, so, so that, uh, that there's a better chance of the retrograde guide wire uh, getting into the guideliner and then into the guide. And the technique we used also is, is called a draft technique, which stands for deflate, uh, retract, and advance into the fenestration technique. And essentially, what you do is you inflate a balloon on the anterograde <laughs> wire, and one operator deflates and retracts that balloon, while at the same time, uh, a second operator can advance the retrograde wire and, and try to make the connection from the subintimal space into the true lumen. And luckily, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a running angiogram of, uh, of when we did that, but uh, that was actually successful in this case. So. So here we basically have our Pilot 200 uh, wire that, the, the, that was the retrograde wire. We were able to get it into the guideliner and into the guide. And so now it's all the way into the an anti-grid guide. And at this point, really, we were able to exchange it out for a, an R350 uh, uh, externalization wire. And then over that, we were able to uh, uh, advance to two 30, long 38 millimeter stents. And um, you know, once we implanted those two, we, we thought potentially the, the mid-left circumflex might need another stent. We tried to deliver that, but uh, uh, the, the strand got partially stripped off. So, uh, but we were luckily able to retrieve it and, and avoid another, uh, another significant challenge here. There, we did IVIS, uh, this, and there was, uh, as we can see probably on the angiogram here, under expansion of the stent at the left main ostium. It was a very fibrotic occlusion. So the post dilate the left main ostium as much as possible with the uh, uh, non-compliant balloon. And this was our final result. So uh, all in all, I think it was a fairly good result. Uh, still, the left main ostium does look potentially a little bit underexpanded, but I think uh, we, we hit it as hard as we, as we possibly could. And uh, there's flow going down into left, uh, the left circumflex and the OM as well. The patient uh, did well. I think in the end uh, of the procedure, she was relatively uh, chest pain free here. and. Uh, at the end, we did take a look at the graft as well, uh, because uh, obviously there is, uh, uh, any time that you do a retrograde PCI through a vein graft, uh, at the end, you do want to make sure there's not teeny two or three flow, because if there is, there's uh, potentially a case for, for coiling it so that you don't get competitive flow uh, leading to uh, stent, stent uh, occlusion or thrombosis. But as we expected, there, uh, the, the graft still had no flow, so we left it like that. So the take home points from this case, I would say, one is that anytime we try to do PCI of an old degenerated friable uh, vein graft, it's extremely challenging, especially when you have a large thrombus burden in the graft. And, uh, P and as, as we know, there's more and more data emerging that uh, PCI of the native coronary artery should always be entertained and, and, and thought of as an option. In, a, in an acute STEMI situation, in an acute occlusion of a vein graft, uh, the, uh, the PCI of the native coronary artery can be attempted, I would say, based on uh, clinical situation feasibility and uh, the expertise available at, uh, at your uh, centers, especially if you're uh, well-equipped with, uh, with the hybrid CTO algorithm and, and operators that are familiar with that. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll open this up for uh, discussion a little bit. I think um, you know, vein graft uh, intervention is very challenging, and uh, there is a scoring system for vein graft uh, degeneration. If you look at that vein graft, the chances of shorter long-term patency is probably less than 5%. Um, in this particular case, it is challenging to do a native, but I think uh, many people would try to do something there. I mean, ultimately, that's what you did. Not everybody has the skill sets, but certainly uh, looks like you got a, ph a phenomenal result. The other thing is if you do that vein graft and you try to balloon it and try to stent it, chances are you'll trash everything. Uh, and it's all from downstream embolization as opposed to epicardial aspects. So you have to be worried about that. Once you get some flow, it might be enough to stop. So. Any, uh, any? I was just going to underscore that same point and ask it as a question. So it's not just the inability to open it, it's the embolization. So was there any thought to not trying to balloon and laser and things in the vein graft and just from the get-go use it as a conduit to do the retrograde CTO? Yeah, I think that in her situation, we, we wanted to give it a try because uh, we thought that even if we can we can analyze it to some extent, potentially. We were not hopeful that it would, it would stay open for long. 
but uh, we thought that if potentially we can get some flow going, we could potentially bring her back uh, while just uh, temporizing the situation, getting her chest pain free, and, and then uh, go and, and attempt the CTO uh, using that vein graft, and hopefully it's still, it's still patent, even though you can use occluded vein grafts as well, as long as there is a stump uh, in, in that vein graft. But that was, the, that was the thought at this point. So we thought, okay, let's, let's give it as good a try as we can to salvage this vein graft um, uh, you know, as best as we as best as we could, uh, but we, we really couldn't. So we, we, we and, and she was continuing to have chest pain. And, and so we thought that, uh, and, and we didn't uh, know how much progress we would make retrograde as well. And uh, we know in the acute situation, it would, it would take a long time to potentially uh, work uh, to do that CTO. I mean, cases like this have been, have been done, but uh, we didn't, we just, uh, we thought it, would, it might take a very long, take a long time as well. So see if we can at least get some flow. I mean, the good thing is, yeah, you had some flow there. So that would be yeah. the time to at least, uh, now that you have some flow, um, yeah. uh, you can you can work on something else. So. Thank you. Very nice. Would, would there be any utility in using mechanical aspiration with Mundaro or F or Andrew did? Would you consider that? Yeah, I, I, I mean, uh, uh, potentially, I, 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 we tried just to export, uh, you know, aspiration catheter. Uh, I haven't uh, uh, you know, experienced that, but potentially. I think it's probably I don't a little, know. little game and probably some, certainly some potential harm with Andrew Jet in that situation. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next talk is uh, our next case is an uncommon case, uh, cause of hypotension during CSI atherectomy by Solomon Spiegel. Okay, uh, nothing to disclose. Okay, um, my name is Solomon Spiegel. Uh, I'm the Interventional Cardiology Fellow at Texas Tech University. Uh, I'd like to thank the moderators and the meeting organizers for having me for this. Um, so I'm here to present an uncommon cause of hypotension during CSI atherectomy. Uh, I'm hoping we can have a little fun with this as well. So uh, we had a patient come in, uh, complained of chest pain, troponin was elevated. It was a 76 year old male. Uh, he was having typical chest pain. Um, improved slightly with nitroglycerin. I had to present to do an outside emergency center, um, but left AMA two days prior. Um, and then he had kind of a questionable history of atrial fibrillation. Uh, home medications, as you see, had a history of high blood pressure, COPD, dyslipidemia, was a type two diabetic. Um, he was an alcohol abuser, six pack of beers daily, um, has been smoking half a pack a day for 40 to 50 years. Um, on exam, uh, vital signs generally stable. His heart rate was a little bit quick. Um, his, uh, his exam was consistent with atrial fibrillation. Uh, uh, in terms of his objective, a uh, little bit anemic. Um, white blood cell count was acceptable. Kidney function okay. LDL uh, not quite under control. Um, BMP was elevated, and uh, we used high sensitivity troponin, um, which is uh, 381. So uh, ECG. Um, pretty much just uh, atrial fibrillation, um, maybe a, some lack of anterior forces. Uh, his chest x-ray, he had uh, bilateral pulmonary edema, uh, right side pleural effusion. So he was taken by the CICU team uh, for cardiac cath. Um, so as you can see from the initial films, um, great steak and cigarettes uh, diet in West Texas, this is what you get. Okay. Uh, heavy calcification, this LAO caudal projection. Uh, and then LEO crani as well, critical lesions in both the circumflex and the LED uh, with a lot of diffuse disease. And then uh, widely open CTO of the right. Uh, no, yeah, so it's right, right not looking great either. Uh, also did an LV gram and saw that he had an inferior apical aneurysm and uh, grossly depressed EF. So uh, a balloon pump was placed following the procedure and the CIC team actually consulted the cardiothoracic surgeons for their opinion. Um, they said due to uh, lack of mobility, alcoholism, and general poor condition uh, that they did not recommend for cabbage. And uh, so at that time, he was referred to our complex BCI uh, team uh, to evaluate for intervention. Uh, the surgeon also uh, discontinued the balloon pump at that time. So <clears throat> we elected to pursue CCI, CSI for this patient. So uh, here's another animation of the just the CSI passing. Uh, we elected to just go for the LAD initially with plans to bring him back for the circumflex in the future. So 
CSI uh, went well. We did angio post atherectomy. Um, some, some improvement in the lesions throughout the LAD, uh, but we felt primarily would allow us to, de us to deliver our stents and expand them well. So he ultimately required three stents in the LED. Here's the third stent being deployed. Um, so then all of a sudden we had a drop in the blood pressure following the third stent, 75 over 44. Um, so in the, in the effort, essence of time, uh, I won't uh, ask everybody to reply here, but uh, what actions do you take is really kind of what hits you next. So, um, so our, you know, our first thought was, well, you know, maybe the, you know, you, you're using a viper wire in CSI, it's, a, it's pretty sharp, maybe we had a distal wire perforation, um, you know, maybe there was some, some complication of the procedure itself. So we took a shot, we pulled the wire back slightly, but we didn't want to lose complete position. We saw no distal wire perforation, we saw no uh, collection of fluid around the heart, um, and we saw no distal bleed. We did stay on longer than this, but uh, no distal bleed. So next thought, um, you know, in these cases, we're always worried about tamponade. So we had a uh, bedside echo available. We got a stat echo. Um, you can see in the subcostal projection, uh, no evidence of fluid around the heart. Um, so now we're kind of we're kind of thinking, what what do we do here? We've got we got the pla the patient on pressors. Uh, we've started IV fluids. We're considering uh, reversing our anticoagulation. So. Next thought, access site issues. Do we have a problem with our access site? So we were in the left groin, took a shot here, everything looks good. All right, so anyone have any thoughts? Hey, uh, was the echo show normal? Echo was normal, yeah. How about the rest of the panel? How long do you think? Uh, can you play the anterior again? I'm not sure if the black blood vessel is a little sort of uh, displaced to the side of the HP fluid there, but there's not, I don't see any fluid coming out. So, so we routinely give aminophilin beforehand to combat the hypotension from the release of denosine during atherectomy. Uh, I have not seen it present like this, but you definitely see it acutely. Uh, so I don't know if that was a concern or not. Now with the aminophilin shortage, we're using caffeine, but that's another option or another which issue. Is one common right yeah. coronary artery, which is occluded and you worked on the LED. So, so your guide configuration, sometimes you can get severe aortic regurgitation with a guide pushing down the aortic valve. Yeah, we did reposition the guide, um, and and again on the echo, we, we looked at, at flow as well. I only you know demonstrated for the sake of time the lack of an infusion. Oh, but delayed shock from contrast. I'm sorry. Contrast. Delayed shock from the yes, contrast. Yeah. So so I think that's kind of where we where we were starting to think. Um, but actually, as I leaned over to take this left shot, I leaned on the right side of the patient and noticed that he was having a large hematoma growing, growing at the side of the former balloon pump. Um, so he had a balloon pump removed two days prior and he had late bleeding here. So then the next question was, what do you do with this? So call vascular surgery, you know, 30 minutes, calls cardiothoracic surgery, two hour response, call interventional radiology, they get back to you two days later, uh, or do you take care of it yourself? <laughs> so obviously we, we elected to take care of it ourselves. So. We crossed over, shot the right groin, and you see perforation here. So obviously holding manual pressure at that time as well, um, in between getting our equipment in place. Um, we, we tried to balloon tamponade for 15 minutes, but we were unsuccessful in doing so. So uh, we have uh, VBX stents, and um, these are covered, oops. Uh, these are covered stents, um, and we deployed a VBX stent to control the bleed. And we had a good result. Did you not complain of groin pain at that time? No. No. No complaints from the patient. That's a great case. I think it underscores the importance of also VBX also goes to our eight French. You had eight French access, which is nice. So it's yeah. important to understand what, what your what your access is and what you can deliver. Otherwise, you could deliver a biobond there would have been fine too. Mm -hmm. So post procedure, uh, the patient's blood pressure stabilized with IV fluids. Pressures were both withdrawn within one day. Um, the hemoglobin dropped, uh, it was 10 before the procedure dropped to 7, uh, but he did not require any transfusion, it remained stable from 7 and, and, and actually rose throughout the rest of his stay. He was discharged three days following the procedure, he returned one month later and we did CSI to his P uh, and PCI to the left circumflex. So the takeaways from this case, uh, it's important to be familiar with all the causes of hypotension uh, and be able to review them quickly in the cath lab. Um, it's important to be intimately familiar with the history of the patient, we were aware of the balloon pump, 
uh, and, and, we, and we recognize that was the, the cause of this issue. Uh, and then it's important to be comfortable in the peripheral interventional space, uh, even as a coronary operator, because uh, these complications arise and you need to be able to manage them in case of an emergency. Thank you. Great case. So how about, um, how many people would have just put a balloon up there and reversed anticoagulation and just waited um, to avoid putting a stent in an inflection point in the uh, artery? Yeah. Why not? Yeah, uh, well, we, try, we tried tamponade for 15 minutes and, and it was still bleeding Did you reverse quite profusely. anticoagulation? Or um, so we did not reverse anticoagulation. Obviously, we stopped dosing, but uh, I, I think we were, you know, kind of, we were still a little bit nervous about the, the, the intervention itself. We didn't want to have, you know, thrombosis of the stents early, but I mean, There's I suppose. There's a lot of calcification there, too, so yeah. I think it, it was probably a split mm -hmm. of, a, of a plaque, so I, I don't think balloon was going to hold that. I think that was probably appropriate. But I, I, I agree with you. I would have done balloon first for 20 minutes and just also had the fellow hold for external and internal tamping on. Right. The other thing is uh, we tend to get you know, patients all covered up, so you may not even look at that groin. Sometimes they cover that whole area up. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important, to, like you said, to try to uh, assess the whole patient, something you might miss. Questions? Uh, did you think of uh, possibly doing this case with some dynamic support, like with an impella, because you, know, you have a patient, no, yeah, maybe also this is archaic, um, and as soon as you wire the LED, you may run into the problem or if not just wiring that LED, and then the patient is going to be pretty in bad shape if you don't have Yeah, what, what element was not accessing uh, the groin again? You know, it was two days later. Um, but we were prepared for impella. We actually had in the room um, should we need it. But, uh, you know, the patient's hemodynamics were stable inter going into the procedure. We've done CSI in a number of cases without any kind of, um, you know, significant requirement for support. So, um, so we felt comfortable proceeding without it. The other thing is, uh, did you guys uh, pre-treat uh, her with GP3A prior to the CSI? Yeah, we just use separate. That's good. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent case. Next up is the unusual suspect, a case of coronary subclavian vertebral steel successfully treated with left subclavian stenting by Zain ul Abedin Assad. Did I say it okay? Yes. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm a Zainal Abedin Asad. I'm a second year general cardiology fellow from University of Oklahoma. We are going to discuss uh, an interesting case of coronary subclavian vertebral steel. So our objectives will be to recognize the um, condition of subclavian stenosis, uh, which can potentially manifest as angina in patients who have history of bypass surgery with a lima graft, and we'll briefly overgo the intervention and other physical signs and symptoms. So our case was a patient who was 60 years old, presented with very atypical symptom of exertional fatigue, which was thought to be an uh, angina equivalent, and his past history was significant for bypass surgery four years ago with a lima graft to his diagonal and three other cephnus vein grafts. So he had traditional cardiovascular risk factors, uh, smoking, diabetes, um, and uh, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. On physical exam, the interesting finding was about more than 20 millimeter mercury blood pressure difference between both arms. And if you note, the blood pressure is lower in his left arm as opposed to the right arm. Because the symptoms were very atypical, we did not proceed directly with the angiogram. We first decided to do myocardial perfusion imaging, which showed um, some evidence of anterior ischemia. So after that, we performed this angiogram. And I'm just going to show you the pictures on the left side. And we found that the graft is not doing what it is supposed to do. So if you notice here that the I don't know why it's not playing. 
So the other findings on the angiogram were known disease from before in all three natives. Other three graphs were uh, patent. And um, at that time, uh, we were not really sure what's responsible for the patient's fatigue. So like uh, we stopped the procedure there, we discussed with the patient that we have noticed some reversal of flow in your graft, which might be responsible for your symptoms, might not be. We can try to fix it, and with an informed decision-making approach, we decided to proceed with an arch uh, angiogram. Um, I don't know why this video is not playing here. Yeah, but the, I can't see Mouse. here. So this is the picture of the arch. You can notice uh, reversal of flow here. Not only in the lima graph, but also in the vertebral, if you notice in the late images. Uh, at that point, we decided to go with a left radial approach. And there you notice that at the ostium of the left subclavian, there is significant stenosis. this segment here. Okay, let me play the previous picture once again, which shows the reversal of flow in the graph. Okay, so at that point we decided to proceed with the intervention thinking that this uh, osteal subclavian stenosis is responsible for his symptoms. So we used a right common femoral approach to advance a shuttle sheath, uh, left radial axis with a multipurpose guide catheter to advance all the way to the site of subclavian occlusion. Um, and it was a long segment of occlusion here. We made like multiple attempts trying to cross this uh, lesion anti-grade and we were not successful. At that point we decided uh, retrograde attempts which resulted in a sub plane entry. Now here we were able to cross, but at the aortic end, we had to snare this uh, miracle wire with the gooseneck snare. Then we used a quick cross catheter to exchange this miracle wire for a whole length pulley wire, uh, parked it in distal auxiliary and started ballooning, uh, followed by deployment of a stent. But we still noticed that there was some residual stenosis in the uh, ostium and really proximal part of the subclavian here. And uh, when we measured the pressure gradient across, it was still significant, about 20 millimeters of mercury gradient. So at that point, we decided to again um, deploy another stand and balloon this. And here is the final result showing good flow. Interesting thing is that at follow-up within the next two weeks, the patient's symptoms did not completely disappear. However, at the two months follow-up, his symptoms completely resolved. Thank you. Questions? Well, I don't have any explanation. Looking at other published similar cases, usually in two to three months after the procedure, the symptoms tend to go away. Patients who have typical left upper extremity symptoms, uh, they usually go away quickly after the intervention. But patients with steel phenomena and some symptoms attributing to those, we don't know why. Their symptoms persist for some time. Probably takes some time for hemodynamics to adjust. filter in the vertebral because if you, going through that, did you guys think about that or because obviously if you throw something up that vertebral, you got a big issue? Um, I don't think that was uh, discussed or considered, but that's, that's an interesting uh, approach. Because once you open that flow from below, that now embolic debris can go north into the reversal flow. And, and some people say it's 20, 25 minutes. 
30 minutes, you can follow the angiogram and you can see where the flow is starting to reverse. But obviously, it can be an issue, especially when you're dealing with the chronic total occlusion. So you always... Uh, I do from do the left arm, so it allows me to see exactly where the vertebral is, too, as long as you don't be careful not to trap the wire. Okay. Yes. You have a left-sided angiogram because in the last picture, you have a retrograde flow in the edema. Um, um, left, like, coronary left diagnostic? Left coronary angiogram. Yes, uh, you want me to, let me see if it does not cut into time again. Post, uh, yes, he, he did have it. I did not include it here. Yeah. Yes. The bypass surgery was uh, four years ago. Yeah. Most likely, yes. Exactly. This is a very good point. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Hey, great job. Okay, thank you. Our next talk is um, a curious case of refractory recurrent coronary vasospasm by Mohammed Ayub. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Talha Ayub. I'm from Stroger Hospital, one of the third-year medical residents over there, uh, one of the cardiology fellowship aspirants also. So uh, we'll start. Uh, I'm presenting today a curious case of refractory recurrent coronary vasospasm. The objectives of this presentation is today to recognize uh, early recognition of non-plaque rupture causes of acute coronary syndrome and highlighting the role of hypersensitivity in such types, subtypes of ACS and also describing the role of pharmacotherapy in certain rare cases of ACS. So we'll start with my case summary. I'm presenting a 29-year-old Hispanic female who has this past medical history and who's basically presented with three serial hospitalization. We'll go through them briefly. The first presentation was in March 2017 where she presents with five days of recurrent anginal chest pain. Vitals were stable. She had elevated troponins when she presented to the ED. And she had a leukocytosis with the eosinophilia with absolute eosinophilic count of 0 0.7. So this is the presenting EKG. As you can see, ST segment depressions and ST elevations in AVR. This is a coronary angiogram uh, on presentation considering that she had an NSTEMI. And as you can see in the aria cranial view, there's sphere spasm of, um, let me play it, sorry. So sphere spasm of LAD which resolved after intracoronary vasodilator therapy. Then this is, the, this is also the same angiogram showing uh, LAO view with no evidence of spasm in the uh, RCA. So RC has no spasm as you can, guys can see here. So, So after two days, while the same hospitalization, patient developed uh, recurrent chest pain, had hypotension and sinus bradycardia, and also had ST elevations and inferior, inferior, um, <clears throat> inferior leads. So it was presumed to be a spasm of RCA, and, it, and that was the etiology that we thought of as, as a decompensation of her um, um, stable state. And she was managed conservatively and discharged on day five with um, isosorbide mononitrate 30 and amlodipine 2.5 milligrams. Uh, this is the EKG on the second day when she became hypertensive and bradycardic. Now she comes back again two months later in May 2017 with the same complaints with vitals that were stable and we managed the patient uh, supportive management without any angiogram diagnostic or therapeutic and optimized the medical therapy, went up from 30 to 60 and also uh, added deltiazem for vasospastic antenna. 
Now she comes back again in November 2017 with recurrent episodes of chest pain at rest for four days. In the ED, she was, uh, her vitals, her heart rate was 104, uh, blood pressure was uh, 98 over 67, and she had elevated tropes, again, with leukocytosis showing eosinophilia, absolute new eosinophilic count of 1.5. This is the EKG from presentation without any non that with no specific symptoms when she presented. And this is after a certain time while she was in the ED when she started developing recurrent chest pain that you can see the <clears throat> While she was in the ED, she became bradycardic, hypotensive, and had a PEARS, needed a CPR uh, with the return of uh, spontaneous circulation. She was intubated and initiated on mechanical ventilation. Initially, was managed conservatively with ivimidazolam and nitroglycerin. But six hours later, she developed worsening bradycardia and hypotension and was taken for coronary angiogram. So these are the sorry about that. I'm trying to show the first. Here. So this shows sphere spasm of RCA, as you guys can see. And then this is after initial intracoronary vasodilator therapy, not completely resolved. And this is after intracoronary 1,500 micrograms of nitro, verapamil, epsiximab, and hydrocortisone that the patient had. So some improvement in her RCA spasm. That's the peripheral angiogram, and we wanted to put in the intraortic balloon pump, the catheter pullback, demonstrating CFS spasm, as you guys can see on this um, video. I will play it again. Okay, so angiogram findings, multifocal vasospasm of RCA, circumflex, and right common femoral arteries, and that was relieved with high doses of intracoronary verapamil, nitroglycerin, afliximab, and intravenous hydrocortisone. Left femoral intraiotic balloon pump was placed, and patient was hemodynamically stabilized. This is the echo on day two that shows severe diffuse hypokinesis with reduced EF, 25 to 30%, 20 to 25%, sorry. Okay, what's the clinical impression here? So patient is presenting with recurrent presentations, with recurrent vasospastic angina, despite the fact that she was on ISMN and deltiazam, had hyper eosinophilia with high um, absolute eosinophilic count, had sphere multifocal coronary and perif uh, peripheral arterial vasospasm, had left ventricular dysfunction with the EF of 20 to 25%, and had an elevated serum tryptase and urinary histamine. Also had elevated IgE levels for dog allergens. So what's the differential diagnosis here that we were thinking about? One is type 1 Kunis syndrome, which, which is allergic vasospastic angina. Then is eosinophilic granulomatosis and polyangitis. And third one was isolated eosinophilic coronary arthritis. Is this Kunis syndrome? What do you guys think? So based on our um, definite diagnosis, definitely needs a myocardial biopsy, brain, um, a heart bio, um, biopsy, but considering that the turn of events, patient was managed uh, medically, was shifted on heart failure service, and was optimized in terms of her heart failure. And she improved her LV function. She also improved her uh, hemodynamic status. So the question for a definitive diagnosis through a uh, biopsy was deferred uh, as of now. So Kunis syndrome is basically the concurrence of acute coronary syndrome, such as coronary spasm, acute myocardial infarction, and stent thrombosis which conditions associated with mast cell and platelet activation. This is the brief pathophysiology, taking into account all those allergic uh, mast cell and histamine activation. So certain allergens that can actually trigger um, and certain environmental factors that can trigger the Kunis syndrome. Three types, basically. Type 1 is in normal coronary arteries. Type 2 basically happens in atheromatous uh, <coughs> coronary vasculature. And type 3 happens Type 3 is basically stent thrombosis. 
So diagnosis is based on uh, clinical symptoms and signs. Obviously, labs that are supportive include peripheral eosinophilia, elevated urinary histamine, elevated tryptase, positive aeroallergy panel, and elevated cardiac enzymes. And imaging something also based on the angiographic features that can suggest Conus syndrome. The treatment acute is definitely intracoronary steroids, vasodilators, and calcium channel blockers, and also intracoronary antiplatelet therapies. Maintenance, you do them with IV or PO steroids, and also with antihistamines. So back to our patient, despite improvement in coronary spasm, patient developed worsening hypertension and tachycardia, diffuse ischemia leading to cardiogenic shock, limited initiated on inotropic sport, aggressive medical therapy and supportive management of cardiogenic shock with intravenous cardiosteroids and antihistamines for type 1 Kuhn syndrome was done, and improvement in EF to 40 to 45% was documented post these measures. Eventually discharged home on day 21 with amlodipine, isocerbide mononitrate, nenatidine, and prednisone, and continues to do well as outpatient. Take home points is our refractive vasospasm is rare with a life threatening emergency. Prompt coronary angiography and intracoronary vasodilators can lead to improvement, and allergic etiology should always be considered, and, admi and administration of corticosteroids is beneficial. Thank you so much. <laughs> Any questions? You guys uh, consult allergy and immunology. For, yes, we did. For what about leukotrienes antagonists, montelukast, et cetera, for standard therapy? I mean, my first thought was 29 year old presenting in Cook County with basal spasm. I'm going to ask you what the UTOPS was. Mm -hmm. uh, but after that, you know, you got to see that something else is going on here, especially with hyperglycemophilia. Yeah, regarding the UTOX, it was serially done on all three presentations, considering definitely our patient population, it was negative. Uh, initial management were more like vasospastic uh, run-of-the-mill angina, but considering afterwards that she was having all those symptoms with peripheral eosinophilia, we started thinking about including rheumatology and allergy about this Kunis syndrome. Um, but as of now, um, in, terms of, in terms of guideline or something, you could try and inhibitors, like there's no per se, <clears throat> I wouldn't say there's no benefit, but as per our literature review, um, <clears throat> they're not, that there should be definite benefit documented with them. Like mainstay is acute, acute treatment with IV intracoronary steroids and anti, um, intravenous, intracoronary vasodilators and maintenance therapy with antihistamines and um, PO steroids. And gradually you taper them down. Very nice case. Everybody heard of Kuna syndrome? <laughs> All of you? <laughs> now you have. Okay. For any experience, uh, have a vasospasm after drug relief and stent? Uh, about vasospasm after DES? <laughs> I mean, I think in the early literature, first generation, we had uh, hyperosinophilia, we had vasospasm, we had aneurysm formation. I don't think any of the fellows have ever seen those things nowadays, but these were the late, uh, late effects of the drug release stance. Um, I mean, vasospasm acutely is probably more from the mechanical irritation, and uh, you also had it at the ostium here as well, so it's a great case for us to keep in mind. I heard one patient after, you know, Texas stand, there's a vasospasm after five, six hours, hmm. pretty severe one. Yeah, so that reason I'm asking. Right? Yeah. She never had any stenting done. No, no, not this mm -hmm. patient. I'm just asking this mm -hmm. I was going to ask you a question, but she's eating. It's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm just messing, just messing with her. <laughs> any other questions? Yes, go ahead. Uh, you also use uh, intracoronary epsixaban. What is the mechanism? Antiplatelet therapies are shown to be beneficial in cases of acute coronaries. Uh, I mean, non-plaque rupture causes of ACS also. Because especially in type 3 corners where you have stent thrombosis. One more question? Uh, I'm a little skeptical about this, the intracoronary steroids, the mechanism Who knows? Uh, Makes sorry. sense, though. You're right. I used to think that also, but I think we also know that we've done these short protocols for anaphylaxis and whatnot, and they seem to work. So if there are pleiotropic effects, it's not clear, um, but I would tend to agree. So. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Mm -hmm. On to our last uh, uh, case presentation. A safety layer becomes a compression sac. Can't leave the feeding uh, small vessel behind. By Mahesh uh, Ananta. It's a long last name. You, you don't have to say. You say my yeah, last I'm, name. I'm sorry. <laughs> <you. laughs> right. Oh, I have no disclosures actually. So. Um, I'm Mahesh, one of the uh, cardiovascular fellows at the University of Minnesota. And uh, give me one second. So this is a 
a patient that we had at the uh, Minneapolis VA Medical Center. And uh, Dr. Kelly is a surgeon who's involved, and uh, uh, we had the IR people involved also, along with the interventional cardiologists. So this is a 72-year-old patient who presented uh, for an elective RCA stenting. Um, he has history of uh, CKD, diabetes, AFib, coronary disease with uh, uh, grafts to Lima LAD, SVG RCA, um, SVG to OM and D1. Other uh, expected history from uh, veterans uh, uh, history, you can see history, hypertension, hypolipidemia, PAD, and his EF was actually 60% when he came. So this was his uh, <coughs> left side angiogram. And uh, you can see his uh, OM was stented, even though he had a graft uh, that was occluded. And um, he has good uh, Lima backflow that you can see in the second picture there on the right side. This is his uh, RCA, first injection. Um, and you can call it close to subtotal, um, the right side. Um, and some flow and is a diffuse long lesion and some bridging collaterals. And this is the result on the right side um, after we stented the prox through uh, the mid and distal RCA. Any comments uh, post stenting? Anything that you would notice unusual? <laughs> no? Okay. Um, so that's just the graft flow back you can see here. Um, so patient continued to have chest pain, did not improve after waiting for 30 minutes uh, in the cath lab. Um, when, they, when the patient came in, he had a stable <coughs> angina presentation, but uh, after the, we did the stenting, we had to wait for uh, 30 minutes, but still pain didn't resolve with all the medications. His blood pressure was looking okay. Um, so we, uh, I showed you the angiogram. Uh, we saw the jailed marginal branch, and then that supplied a small portion of the inferior wall, and this is the one that I was talking about. The, the one on the right side, if you see, in the jailed marginal, and it does supply a small part of the inferior wall and couldn't find something uh, else that you would contribute to the chest pain. So we noticed uh, while doing the procedure, um, the whisper wire to uh, access marginal branch, uh, we had to go through the stent struts, and uh, we found balloon dilatation with a two millimeter uh, uh, balloon. And uh, <clears throat> so the, the wire briefly entered the tiny side branch, not the main marginal, but you can see the um, side branch that's starting above uh, from the marginal branch right here, and that, uh, the wire entered that branch and uh, uh, almost two to three centimeters, and this, was, this wire was withdrawn, and we took a final angiogram picture, and we didn't see anything after that, so we were very convinced that uh, everything looked okay, and we sent the patient to the floor. So after uh, five, 10 minutes, the patient was taken up, and uh, um, he continues to have chest pain, and the EKG is completely different from what he had before, and you can see inferior ST elevations, also V1 ST elevations there. <coughs> And this is his um, ultrasound that we did bedside. And uh, you can clearly see there is um, expanding uh, hematoma on the RV side. And this is compressing your RV. And I got a short axis uh, view and a parasol long axis view, you can see. And this is the RVOT. And obviously, there is no flow from his RV outside. And this is a big hematoma. It keeps expanding. It started like a very small one, like two centimeters or something. And then it just kept expanding. And you can see here, um, the RV body is almost completely compressed. There is no flow. And as expected, the patient is uh, dropping blood pressures in the 70s and is obtended. And uh, he started on dopamine, epinephrine at that point. So I was taken immediately to cath lab. Uh, it's very tricky. You can't uh, do the regular uh, para, uh, pericardiosynthesis with the apical axis because there's no uh, fluid collection at the apex. And uh, it's all left parasternal. And the only window we could see is above the RV anterior. So we had to go for the left parasternal window uh, for uh, epicardial uh, axis. And we used a stiff uh, amplitude wire because it's a lot of coagulum blood hemat accumulation, so we couldn't really force a uh, regular wire through it. So we had to use stiff amplitude for that to advance a uh, precardial um, uh, pigtail catheter. Once after we got that in, uh, we almost got uh, 350 cc of uh, um, blood. I said 300, okay, but 350 cc of blood, and the pressure it was immediate pressure recovery following per pericardial synthesis. And I just want to show you the picture on the right side, which should have come after the next slide. But um, you notice anything unusual here? What is that? I'm sorry. Yeah. So this is like the normal graft flow. But this is where you notice something. You, can, you see a myocardial blush. You see some pulsatile flow right there. So this is uh, obviously a perforation that happened. And this is the angiogram that we, uh, the same thing that I showed you. You can see the perforate right there. 
So obviously we uh, went with the wire, uh, we went through the RV marginal branch as we clearly see it's, uh, we, we, we thought like we, we went to the wire, the side branch here and probably that's perforating so we wanted to occlude that and we uh, ballooned it nicely for some time and uh, even with that you can still see the myocardial blush and still <coughs> uh, the perforation still filling. So any suggestions what to be done next at this point? Right, so it's a very good thinking. So this patient, um, you can see this, uh, it's important to notice in patients with uh, chronic subtotal occlusion, I'm just uh, showing this uh, squiggly line here, just to s show you the collateral that arises from here, and it goes all the way above to see the small branch down there. So this patient obviously had subtotal uh, occlusion, and he developed bridging collaterals from the proximal distal branch, are between these two branches, and obviously that's another feeding source that you could expect causing your expanding hematoma, even after trying to occlude your uh, RB marginal branch. So we try to go with the balloon, just uh, do the same thing there. And once after balloon, we try to inject and you still see uh, leaking down there. So we balloon this, we balloon that, and you still see this. So there's like, if you occlude one, it obviously increases the pressure on the other thing. So it, it increases the flow and causes more uh, accumulation. So it's like uh, uh, increasing the resistance at one point and then it builds pressure and it leaks more. So obviously uh, we decided to go and uh, fix both at this point. Um, and that's why we got a picture and you still see the myocardial blush and the perforation down there. And then we uh, uh, went uh, preparing for uh, deploying uh, retrievable coils down there. And, <clears throat> and you can see uh, this picture on the right side showing uh, the coils deployed at the RV marginal brands. And uh, at that point, you could still see the myocardial blush. So we uh, decided to uh, go and um, get the other one from uh, above, a small branch that we talked about. I'm just showing you the same pictures just to show it's still blushing a lot of uh, flow. So you can see uh, we deployed now um, retrieval coils in this small branch above and then this branch below. So at this point, we we're very convinced there was no residual flow. There's no blush that we keep seeing here. I mean, this little flow, I don't know, I'm not very convinced, but that was actually really a lot before we closed this. So. <clears throat> After this was done, obviously, you know, when uh, someone is bleeding, we uh, cannot, uh, we just put in stents in this patient. We cannot be using anticoagulation. Very high risk of stent thrombosis. So it's a major risk when somebody is perforating and bleeding. You cannot use anticoagulation. You're risking a stent. Um, so mid RCA, we had to pre-dilate with a three uh, millimeter balloon, um, and we had to put a stent because we had a, a thrombus at the site. And I'll show you the picture of the thrombus. Uh, and then we did post dilated three, uh, three, three cross eight uh, balloon. And we saw some thrombus migrate to the AV groove segment, uh, the PDA branches, and uh, we couldn't do much about it. Uh, we just used a daughter and flared eight, eight, eight atmospheres there. And uh, you could see small emboli, as I told, in, in the distal part. And this is just the ballooning part I'm showing. And uh, this is the final angiogram. And you can see this vessel had a good flow in the beginning, and this is thrombosed at this point. But um, all we could do is just uh, fix this thing again, the thrombus. And uh, now this is a post-cath uh, echocardiogram. And this is just an artifact, you see. It's a range ambiguity artifact. It's nothing different. But uh, you see the RV is completely expanded at this point. And um, this is uh, another view showing uh, RV is down. The function is definitely down. But uh, overall, uh, the, ex the expansion uh, is not there anymore. So important take-home points in this case is uh, coronary perforation is associated with uh, poor outcomes. Um, so definitely don't aim for perfection. I don't know, like was, we were debating for 30 minutes, waiting in the cath lab, trying to see if we should fix that or not, and finally went ahead and just ballooned it. And uh, I don't know if that probably um, started everything. And uh, localized pericardial effusion after cardiac surgery could be uh, rapidly fatal, uh, any cardiac procedure, I mean. Um, so your conventional access may not work all the time, so you have to think about un unconventional access uh, using stiff wires for getting pericardial. This is uh, using a, par a personal space as we were doing in our case. Um, with uh, prior severe occlusion, subtotal beware of collateral circulation causing perforation and leaking around, so you have to go um, get uh, both fixed at the same time. And anticoagulation now obviously now is challenging, cannot use it in a covered stent to cover perforation sometimes can be uh, life saving in this uh, patients, with, but, but obviously leads to a, a hydrogenic myocardial infarction in the territory that the vessel is supplying. All right, that I'll stop and I'll uh, open for questions. And thanks a lot for the opportunity and uh, thank the moderators and chairpersons for uh, inviting case, us here. Very nice case. Any questions from the audience about this case? Go ahead. Uh, I don't actually understand the cause of the pressure of the perforation was your uh, attempt to open the acute marginal branch after you fix the CTO PCI. What was, was something that happened during the CTO PCI? 
No, the thinking process is, uh, I think after we were done with the stenting, we just uh, went ahead and dilated the marginal branch, and then we noticed the, the, the wire, um, whisper wire actually, while well, getting back, it was at once advanced to the small branch coming from the RV marginal branch. So we think that's probably what caused uh, everything. Yeah, from the collateral. So we thought, like, so we were trying to occlude this for a long time and didn't help. Uh, still a lot of flow and actually more flow after we tried to occlude the balloon. So we assumed that it was collateral flow and, um, I don't know, like we were increasing the pressure on one side and uh, building pressure and leaking more from the collateral itself. That's the thinking process. I know, I mean, it's complicated to think when you've already opened up your uh, uh, right side and there's good flow now down there. So it should actually be lower, lowering your flow than uh, when you had a CTO before. But for some reason, it's bleeding more when we tried to balloon that uh, marginal branch. Great, thanks. Uh, one thing I was going to ask you is, uh, I'm not sure, once you've gotten the pericardial synthesis uh, drain in place um, and taken her back for the second look, would anyone consider giving her a heparin to sort of a low dose just to prevent uh, thrombus that's sort of over there? Right, I mean, it was a very significant thrombus we saw. It was like we were uh, looking at the nice stent and then finally saw like multiple thrombus. But we were debating a lot with the rate of bleeding and the patient was almost dead. He was uptended, he had to intubate and, and uh, um, pressures were in the 70s. So we were like, <laughs> just uh, risking his life without at this point. It's okay to compromise his complete RCA. <laughs> and, 